Hey, everybody, this is the Innovation Conversation. I'm Kevin Koop. And I'm Tom Furphy. So Tom and I on, on opposite coasts have been watching the House of Representatives. Um, it's the subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. They're looking at antitrust and they had um, the four tech CEOs up today. Um, apparently had some technological glitches, which I think is pretty funny. Um, they were all appearing virtually. And so we were both watching it and we thought we'd sort of compare notes and comment on, on what they were saying and some of the questions being asked. And I guess, Tom, my first reaction is, uh, is, it just, uh, is that this format isn't good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> beyond the fact that they're asked to, everybody gets to ask questions for five minutes and they do a second round of questions for five minutes. And now they're, I guess they're gonna do a third round of, of, of questions for five minutes. It's on in the background there because they're just finishing up. Um, it's, you can't get at the nuance of what is, you know, the, the digital economy and e-commerce and, and these are incredibly complicated companies and they're trying to digest, ask questions and get answers in five minutes and nothing is good about it. And then the idea that they're all doing it virtually and they're on screens, looks like crazy. It is crazy. I think I caught maybe an hour and a half of it or so, um, and to me, it struck me that the Congress people were bullies. I mean, they would, you know, they have their agenda, they have, you know, their kind of embedded political positions, you know, within the very real issues, They're clearly very real issues that need to be addressed. You know, but when you have five minutes and probably four of the five minutes are the Congress person speaking, um, you know, around the allegations. And then when the, uh, when the CEO would try to offer some context uh, around the allegation or around the issue being discussed, they're often cut, you know, cut right off. Um, and that's tough because these are complex issues and they all deserve to have some level of context. It's hard to answer a simple yes or no to, to these issues, especially when you're under oath. Yeah, well, and my feeling is, and I watch enough congressional hearings, I always hate it because I always feel like, and I don't care who's doing the questioning from which party and who's, in, who's, being, who's testifying, there's never enough time to get at the meat of things. And it always works against them. And um, I just I just hate it. And my feeling is if once you get to Congress, there's gotta be nuance. If you're that far along in the process, there's gotta be nuance. And the idea of reducing it to, trying to yeah. reduce it to sound bites is crazy. I did think it was interesting. I was trying to write down um, things that they were often saying. Um, it was funny, they were always, say, they would always say, well, I appreciate the question. And finally, the chairman had to say, stop saying that. We stop can't. appreciating our questions. We know they're good questions. They also <laughs> would say, this is, I always, the other line I heard constantly was, I want to respectfully disagree with that characterization. <laughs> 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 Which happened a lot because yes. I think, you know, um, I mean, there are some interesting sort of fundamental disagreements. So let's talk about Bezos and Amazon for a minute because that's sort of the sweet spot for, for, um, morning Newsbeat. It seems to me that I mean, there's a one of the fundamental disagreements, or at least the way they look at it differently, is the fact that they are talking about specifically e-commerce, and Bezos wants to put it in the context of the larger marketplace. Right? Yeah, this is all of retail. You have to consider us this way, and they're saying no, no, we're only talking about e-commerce, and that's a fun. I don't know how you get. I don't know how you persuade one side or the other to change their minds. Yeah, I think today they're about 38% of e-commerce. I believe that's in the U.S., which is a big number, you know, but e-commerce is a overall is 20% of retail, you know, so that puts them somewhere around, you know, six, seven, eight percent uh, max uh, of total retail in the U.S., um, which certainly doesn't position them all in as the largest retailer. I mean, we know at least Walmart's bigger. Um, well, and, I, and Bezos made that point, I think, several times. <laughs> you know, so it, it was almost like he was saying, what, about, what do you mean me? What about Walmart? They're bigger right. than Walmart, and they're, doing yeah. the, they're trying to do the same stuff that we're doing. Yeah, they contend that, you know, Jeff contends that and Amazon contends, and I think rightfully so, that e-commerce is a channel. Right. It's not, you know, it's not an industry. It's a um, way to get to the customer. It's not, it's not an industry in, unto itself. And, and clearly there was a, a, a big difference on how data is used. I mean, this goes back to, I think, to a conversation you, even, you and I even had earlier this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're talking about how data is used to, to determine whether or not to create a private label. And I would always maintain, well, there are certainly degrees 
but every retailer looks and says, Ooh, we're selling a lot of that. Let's do a private label version. I mean, that's right. a, a fundamental of retail. Uh, um, and so I, but nobody, nobody came out and said it that way. Like everybody else is doing it. Why shouldn't we be allowed to? Yeah. I mean, I think it's you know pretty evident that retailers will watch the performance of national brands or, you know, or brands that are even regional brands or local brands that are performing well on their shelves. And in some cases will decide that there's an opportunity to offer their own version of that. But that's no, no different than just a brand saying, I want to offer a competing product to another brand uh, and building something. So to me, that's not that crazy. Yes. Retailers do have the home field advantage where they control their shelf and they can see the performance of those items. Um, you know, I think the, the, um, the issue that's being posed to Amazon, or the question is, did you use confidential information, uh, you know, improperly uh, to do that? Or did you use specific third party merchant or competitor information to do that? And I think you were hearing, um, you know, Jeff and Amazon's response to that was that we used anonymized aggregated data, um, you know, and the user of that data by policy and by design of systems inside Amazon is not supposed to know or see if that represents, you know, one seller of that product, you know, five, 10 or a hundred sellers of, of, of that type of product. Um, now you can go to the, everything's relatively transparent. So you can go to the website and see how many sellers there are of it. Um, so you can kind of piece that together. Um, so, you know, I think there's some gray area around that. I don't think Amazon certainly is, is completely uh, innocent here, but I do believe that they have policies internally to protect uh, merchants from that. Um, but it's also a big company and it's hard to police every single individual in the company. Well, and Bezos said that several times and maybe a couple of other than that. We have policies about that. I, I, you know, I can't swear to you that we that the policy has never been broken right. for a big company. But we, but we do have policies about it and we continue to, he talked about counterfeits that way, right? Mm -hmm. We have policies Absolutely. about it, we're, we're working on it, we know we're not perfect, but we're, we're trying to get that done. Well, I mean, if, if, if Amazon had a pervasive issue of blatantly, you know, obtaining third party product information, in some cases that could be product content, formulation, you know, of products, uh, performance of products, all that, if they were to, to consistently do that and systematically do that, that's going to erode their ability to attract sellers to the platform, even with lots of customers out there. And that ultimately is bad for the customer. So, you know, I, I just think that Amazon is, is not, they want to do things, they legitimately want to do things that are best for the customer. And, you know, and they'll have policies to support that and they'll police those policies. But, you know, with thousands and thousands of people in those, in those, um, you know, in those um, groups inside the company, you know, selling and working on those products, it's going to be hard to, you know, ensure that 100% of the time, you know, everybody is, uh, everybody's on top of that. And same goes for, for counterfeit products too. counterfeit products. And Jeff even said that today, you know, counterfeit pro uh, products are not good for their, for their customers, and they want to find them. And he also pushed for, um, for even stricter laws and enforcement around that, even yeah. outside of Amazon, which I thought yeah, was he was looking for a, he was looking for a hammer, not just you know to, right. that he could yeah. like a lot of retailers who were looking for more enforcement from the government when it comes to things like masks. He was basically saying, "Give me, give me something I can work with here." It is tough. I mean, it's like whack a mole. You know, I mean, every time you get one, another one pops up, and you got to keep trying to hammer them down. And um, you know, they have they have they said they have a thousand people in their company that work on. Um, identifying and screening out counterfeit products. That's a, that's a lot of people. Well, I thought Bezos had two, well, he had a lot of good moments, I thought. Um, one was when he was talking about, he, at one point he said, um, and this is a line you'll know, he said, I'd rather give up a sale than give up a customer, right? Classic Bezos. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing he was, he was talking when, when they, they actually played audio of a, somebody, I guess, who had been doing business on Amazon and then everything but they they that whoever that person was said they stopped getting support and suddenly their sales you uh, know you know went into the into the crapper and and his his response was i want to talk to them they said what do you say about that i want to talk to that person i want to you know and that's what i think that's what people have to do so listen if things go badly i'll i'll fix it you know i'm ceo of the company i can fix that that's a good that's a good sort of uh, 
level of responsibility for him to take. I think so. It's not realistic, though, with millions of sellers for him to do that with every discounted seller. Because at every point in time, I guarantee there's at least... I hope well, somebody gets a phone call tomorrow. Is right. That, well, no, I, I think in that case, for sure. And let's take some learnings from that case. But, you know, I'm sure at any given point in time, there's tens of thousands of sellers that are unhappy. So it would be hard to talk to all of them. Um, but that's why you have, you know, policies and procedures in place to have a fair trading environment for those sellers. And if... And if there's a, an instance, you know, or, you know, a chronic problem of, of that not working and not providing that environment, then you have to go find it. So you do need these data points from, from customers to do that. You can't necessarily reply to all of them or respond to all of them, but you can certainly use that information to provide and, you know, make sure you provide and maintain a better environment. It was interesting. I, I, cause I'd read some stories they say about it in advance. They said, well, Be Bezos was going to tell his personal story. And I, I sort of rolled my eyes and said, why are you wasting our time with that? But then he talks about it, about being the, 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 the son of, a, of a, a woman who gave birth to him as a single mother while in high school, you know, and then and his, that his father, his stepfather was a, um, a Cuban immigrant. This is not a guy who grew up with a, any kind of, I mean, barely had a spoon in his mouth, much less a silver spoon in his mouth. I mean, it's a great American story. And I thought that was the other interesting, all of them sort of position their companies that way, that this is, we are good for America. These are uniquely American companies. Mm -hmm. um, they went after Facebook and Google a little bit on those issues, but you know, um, because of, the, of, of how they work with foreign governments, specifically China. Um, but, uh, you know, but the, I thought that was, that was important to say, this is, these are, Ameri these are American success stories. I think they are, yeah, they, they are. Um, you know, foreign uh, government uh, relations notwithstanding, I think they're, they're four great American success stories. That said, we need to, they need to remain, um, you know, positive, successful American companies, you know, that are providing products and services to the American population, uh, you know, to their benefit. And so, you know, I think, you can't only rely on the on the past successes of what you know uh, and that they are that they are an american success you know now we have a challenge of and america hasn't historically been very good at this as companies get very large right how can we better police you know have correct checks and balances or appropriate checks and balances over companies so that that power doesn't get abused right um, but can also allow those companies to continue to thrive and that's a tough balance because when you look back over the over the past, I mean, look at the the biggest company in America in every decade, you know, um, you know, in the in this century for sure, that company was not the biggest company in America the, the following decade. And in most cases, those big companies have actually gone away over time. Yeah, there was a line from I think Zuckerberg said it. Um, he said ha he talked about that. Yes, ten years ago. If you looked at the, the list of the top 10 companies, I think he said only three of them are still on the list. He said, but unlike the, the um, tech, tech companies, but he said, unlike 10 years ago, 10 of the, half of the top 10 tech companies in the world now are Chinese, mm. as yeah. opposed to Amer American. Cool. So I thought, right. He was trying to make the case that you don't want to break up. I think we don't want to eat our own young. Right, exactly. Break, us, break yeah. us up at your own, because then all you're doing is handing more power to the Chinese or whoever. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think we want to enable these companies to thrive, to be good for their shareholders and their customers and be good for, for America, for sure. It's not super easy to do, but it's, it's the opportunity is here now and the time is here now. Requires more than five minutes of at a time. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah, one and one minute of defense within that. Yeah. Uh, you think that I was I was surprised that this, the Google CEO seemed to take on more enemy fire than anybody else. I mean, by by a significant amount, they seem to have it in for him more than they would have had it in for Zuckerberg or Bezos. And I would have thought there would have been a lot more attention to them. Yeah, I mean, they they you know it's almost like there's a like some kind of conspiracy theory that they, you know, and, and it's from, uh, I think each side of the aisle views it a little bit differently, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah, he took on a lot of fire. Um, and I thought he did a pretty good job at responding. Um, 
I mean, are there nefarious algorithms built within Google to support, you know, an agenda that they have? Could there be? Sure, there could be. Um, could there not be? I think it's more likely that there's not. Because again, I think over time, it, those things will erode consumer trust. Right. And you need to be authentic and real. I don't want to authentic is real, but you know, you need, you can't, you, you can't overtly exert bias long term and get away with it. And you know, I thought his responses were very good. You know, they're yeah, they're 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 a platform that relies on advertising. So advertising is a key part of that. It has to be part of it. You can pay for the platform, their, their various services, and not get advertising. Um, but it's ad based, and you know, that's that. Yeah, but they do their best to be kind of fair in that. I mean, at least that's the way he presented it. I thought he did well. And, and they made the argument that if we're if if we were doing this stuff deliberately, it works against our business model. It doesn't work for our business. Model. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because then advertisers are going to, I mean, right now they have a ton of eyeballs. Those eyeballs will, oh, eyeballs, it sounds like so like late 90s, doesn't it? They have a, they have a big audience. Um, and yeah, if that audience erodes over time, you know, their attractiveness to advertisers is going to erode over time. And if they get political, um, that's also going to um, erode advertisers' uh, confidence in them over time. Well, unfortunately, it is, I think everything is political. So la last question, if you had mm -hmm. to... And just based on the tenor of what you saw today, and this is probably going to be the first of, of many hearings like this, and, this, and, and this is not going to be a story that's going to be resolved anytime soon, is it your bet that, that there will, at, at the very least, be much more stringent regulation in the near future and that we're going to start to see companies like Google and Amazon be broken up? I'm not sure on the broken up part. Um, I thought that one congressman, and I forgot his name, but he was like the elder statesman and said that he actually did this would be it. Sense and breath. Yeah. Yes, I, think he's I thought he was really good. And he said, you know, I think our laws are good. I think you guys are good. I think, you know, we need to, we need to um, put you up against our laws. And, but to me, it didn't seem like, you know, he was on a witch hunt out to break him up or, you know, he's just one of, one of many. Um, you know, I think at a minimum, I think we're going to need to have some really clear oversight regulation. So probably self-reporting from these companies, um, some level of audit, you know, that happens, right. you know, I mean, when, you know, when we look back at, you know, what was happening in the securities world and whatnot, 20 years ago, we had Sarbanes-Oxley come in, right? And right. organizations had different, you know, um, you know, compliance requirements and whatnot. I could see some level of that and some level of assurance and attestation or something like that coming out of that and you know potential audit and whatnot and i think ultimately these companies will um will welcome that um so i'm not convinced there's going to be a breakup um and i also don't think it would be the best thing for customers in most cases if you break them up i think there's a lot of synergies in what these companies have built and you know i think if we can regulate it properly um and regulate is such a strong word, but if we can if we can monitor it and have the appropriate checks and balances in place, I think it's best for all. Senator Brenner actually is a Wisconsin Republican, and he said big is not inherently bad. And then um, Ken Buck, a Republican from Colorado, said our witnesses have taken ideas born out of a dorm room and a garage. You have enjoyed the freedom to succeed. I do not believe big is necessarily bad. In fact, big is often a force for good. Um, but they're gonna. It seems to me they're gonna have to. Um, they're going to have to, you know, come to a better and 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 understanding of 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 how these businesses work. I mean, the, oh, yeah. to me, the example was, you know, they kept picking on 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 Bezos because they bought diapers.com and then sold diapers.com. And he said, "Listen, we tried. We spent three hundred million dollars trying to make it work, and we couldn't do it. And eventually, they just had to do it." They closed it. Amazon. Yeah, they closed it. And it was yeah. like. Well, you guys are trying to just buy up businesses and destroy them, and I, I kind of wished that at that moment, um, Bezos had looked at them and said, "Has anybody here ever bought shoes from Zappos?" Zappos was a better business model. It was customer focused, and it, and it's, and it has thrived under Amazon's ownership. If you scroll to the bottom of Amazon.com, you'll see some of the variety of businesses that they own. That, you know, they're, they're going to build, they're going to position it as, as it best serves the customer, and if it's a good brand. It stands on its own, provides a value proposition. They're happy to leave it that way. Well, to be continued, Tom, thanks Absolutely. for being available to do an innovation conversation sort of on the fly. We don't usually cover breaking news, but there you go. Uh, All right. Thanks for thank having me. Thanks for watching. Uh, this is the Innovation Conversation. I'm Kevin Koop. And I'm Tom Furphy. We'll see you next time, everybody.